acting. He appears in the vision with a sword coming out of his mouth. It's a horrifying vision. And he divides the, the he divides humanity into the damned and the saved, or the, yes, the damned and the saved. He says something very interesting. He says, to those who were neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a disgust metaphor, right? To, and what it says is that the worst punishment isn't waiting for those who committed to something and did wrong. The worst punishment is reserved for those who committed to nothing and stayed on the fence. And that's really something too, that's really something to think about, and it's also something I believe to be true, because I see that stasis is utterly destructive. Because there's no progress, all there is is movement backwards. There's aging and suffering and no progress. And so to not commit to anything is the worst of all transgressions. To commit means to put your body and soul into something, to offer your life as a sacrifice means that you're willing to make a bargain with fate. And the bargain is, I'm going to act as if, if I give it my all, then the best possible thing will happen because of that. And to, to not see the analogy between that and the, the act of faith in God is to misunderstand the story completely. And it has to be an act of faith because how are you going to know? You can look at other people, but that isn't going to do it. It's, it. Kierkegaard was very clear about this sort of thing. There's certain sorts of truths that you can only learn for yourself through experience. And that's, of course, why Abram also has to go out alone, right? He has to leave his kin. It's, it's an individual, it's the individuation process. Like dying, it's something that you do alone. There's no way you can tell what is within your grasp, let's say, unless you make the ultimate sacrifice. And there's no way of finding out without actually making it. And so that's the sacrificial act, right? That's, that's re-emphasized in the act of Abram being called upon to sacrifice Isaac. You think about that. It's Abram. He's been doing, he's been like breaking himself into pieces, trying to progress forward through starvation and tyranny and war and deceit and the potential loss of his wife and childlessness and like everything that can really befall you in some sense. And finally, God grants him Isaac when he's old. It's impossible. He gets Isaac, his son. And then what does God do next is say, well, you know that son that you've been waiting for so, for so long? It's like, I'd like to see just exactly what you're made of. So I think you should offer him up as a sacrifice. And I mean, it's a very barbaric story in, in a sense, and maybe in more than just a sense. But Abraham does maintain his covenant. He's willing to make the sacrifice. He's made, willing to make, this is the thing, he's willing to make whatever sacrifice is necessary to keep his covenant with God intact. And that's that. And that's the decision. Well, maybe it's no surprise that people don't do that. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give this land to you to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said to him, this is a sacrificial story again, take an eff, a, a heifer of three years and a goat of three years and a ram of three years and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. It's fairly specific, actually. And he took all these and divided them. And laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. Now, there's a reason for that, and I don't know the reason for it. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. That didn't mean he was afraid of the dark, which is what I thought it meant when I first read it. It isn't what it means. It means that he fell into a trance or something like that, and then... He was enveloped by absolute horror. So that's how this story begins. And here's the commentary from Joseph Benson, who was an English Methodist minister who lived in 1749, but was born in 1749. And when the sun was going down, about the time of the evening, evening oblation, the washing, for he abode by them, praying and waiting till toward evening, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Well, this was not a common sleep through weariness or carelessness, <laughs> I don't know what a sloop is. That's supposed to be sleep. Not a common sleep through weariness or carelessness, but a divine ecstasy that being wholly taken off from things sensible, he might be wholly taken up with the contemplation of things spiritual. 
Well, it really makes you wonder what Abraham was up to in his campsite. So, he was participating in something that enabled this experience. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. This was designed to strike awe upon the spirit of Abram and to possess him with a holy reverence. Holy fear prepares the soul for holy joy. God humbles first and then lifts up. Echoes of psychedelic experience. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Commentaries of Joseph Benson once again. They shall come hither again. Hither to the land of Canaan. Wherein thou now art. Now art. The reason why they must not have the land of promise in possession until the fourth generation is because the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. The righteous God is determined that the Amorites shall not be cut off till they arrived at such a pitch of wickedness. And therefore, till it come to that, the seed of Abraham must be kept out of possession. So the interpretation of the story essentially is that Abraham's descendants will end up enslaved in Egypt for a long, a lengthy period of time, and eventually come back to the land of Canaan. And it's interesting, too, because this is part of Abram's bargain with God, and in this divine vision, I mean, he's been promised everything, but it's a pretty tough bargain, because, you know, when, when, when God is pushed or reveals himself, let's say, he says, look, you're going to get your damn descendants, you know, but it's not going to be, uh, it's, 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 it's going to be a tough journey. They're going to be slay enslaved for a very long time. And eventually come back. And you won't see it. You'll be dead long before then. And so, it's a realistic promise in a sense. And you might say, well, Abram is so de desperate to keep the faith that he's willing to read good into what isn't good. But I think, I, I think, I don't think that's the right way to look at it. I think the right way to look at it is that the people who wrote these stories were very realistic. And they knew that even if things turned out well for you, I mean, it was still going to be real. You know, it wasn't going to be some fantasy. It's like, let's say you have a family that flourishes. It's, people are still going to die. They're still going to get sick. They're, they're still going to have, they're still going to be alive, you know, with all of its suffering. But it'll be, the, but it'll be a life that's rich enough and complete enough so that it'll justify its, its nature, essentially.